Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our December webinar, Best Practices for Real Estate Teams. My name is Victoria Muti. I'm the Agent Relations Specialist here at Allison James Estates and Homes. If you have any questions, please, please type those into the questions box so we will be able to see them. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. I would like to give a special thank you to the sponsor of today's webinar, Movement Mortgage. We have Shelly Hoyseth, the Senior Loan Officer for Movement Mortgage with us today. Good morning, Shelly. Good morning, Victoria. Um, I just want to say hi to everyone out there and talk a little bit about 2015 changes for lending. And um, while there are seemingly always changes going on in lending, I want to highlight a few that will um, and can affect you as realtors. So first of all, uh, Fannie Mae is updating their desktop underwriting, which is the DU system, uh, which is the automated approval system nationally. That actually just got updated as of December 13th, and it involves some different changes. But the one that's the most important and the most exciting is that they are bringing back the 97% loan. So now with conforming loans under 417000 the minimum down payment for conventional financing is just 3%. So um, that is a very exciting thing to make a note of and keep in mind. So clients that have the uh, proper credit scores and don't have a recent you know, short sale or bankruptcy or something can definitely jump in on the 3% um, down. The one caveat that they have added is that one of the borrowers does have to be a first-time home buyer, which means they can't have bought a home in the last three years. So it doesn't necessarily have to be their first time ever, but they need to have not owned a mortgage for at least three years to be a first-time homebuyer. So that's the 97% program. Um, the other thing is the uh, loan limits are changing in 2015. Uh, the conforming loan limits are staying at 417, pretty much that's across the country unless you're in high areas like Alaska and I don't, I don't know if we have anybody in those areas, but um, the high balance loan limits, which is the difference between 417 and before you get into jumbo, those have increased in some areas. In California, we have four counties that have um, that will have an increase. There's three counties in Washington. There aren't any in Florida. I'm just kind of in general thinking of the ones that are out there. If you want to know the specifics on what the maximum loan amount for uh, you know, high balance mortgages in your area, just let me know, send me an email, text, uh, phone, and I will get that information specifically for your area. In general, they've gone up about 15,000 um, in San Diego is a little over 16,000 for the maximum amount. So it's a little bit of a difference. It helps with the down payment, you know, it can shorten people's down payment again. So it's another great thing. Um, the third thing is um, maybe not so great news. The Till, in, which is the truth in lending statement, and the good faith estimate, those forms are all going to be con combined. They're going to condense them from four forms down to two, and that's all fine and dandy. Um, the disclosures on the front end will be the same, but something that you'll want to know, and this doesn't go into effect till August, so I will talk about this a little bit later. You know, I'll bring this up more and more as we get closer. But in August, the new disclosures to, to submit the final HUD will be three days prior to closing. So um, the great thing is at Movement Mortgage, we have the approvals up front. So it's not going to extend our closing timelines since we typically are ready for loan docs you know, within 14, 14 days. It shouldn't really affect your closings if you're using movement mortgage, but if you are using traditional lenders, banks, they are talking about extending their closing times to allow that additional three days. Um, it's something we will be talking about with our escrow agents and maybe something to talk about if you have an escrow team um, that you like in your area, maybe to kind of ask them what their, you know, what their plan is for this so that we can still take care of closing on time. We will be sending our closing instructions out earlier so that um, escrow has more time to get the HUD approved. That way we can still close on time. Uh, where it comes in 
for you guys to know is that last minute credit, seller credits, last minute you know, repair credits, and changes to the contract that will change the actual numbers. We really need to try to get those in the week prior and not you know, the day of like often happens. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, that will be coming in August, so no reason to stress about it right now, but I uh, just wanted to give you a heads up on that. In um, talking about that and the timing of movement mortgage, um, one thing that just recently came up, actually with a, an Allison James agent, uh, we have a, a client that we're working with, and from the onset, it you know, was pretty obvious that this was going to be a challenging file, so I let them know, hey, this is these are the hurdles we're going to be getting having to jump over, and with the client and the agent, you know, we basically said, okay, I'm willing to put in the time and energy to do what it takes to get an approval if you are, but let's know going in that this is a little bit challenging. So uh, we did submit the file, and sure enough, um, I, the first underwritten was a, was a denial, and uh, for the reasons that I suspected we would get. So we put it up the chain and um, got a denial, Again, for the same reasons that I have let them know would most li likely cause a problem. And uh, the beauty of it is that I was able to contact the CEO, contact the head of underwriting, the people that are overseeing our you know, 1,300 employee company, and say, I believe in this file and I need someone <clears throat> that has the ability to make decisions to sit down with me line by line. And we went through the file line by line. They saw where I was coming from. They read everything that the borrower had submitted, and we got an approval. So in, any, in other companies and other banks, you get that initial underwriter denial, it's dead. And uh, so that's one, one beauty. And this client is now conditionally approved, and she's ready to go out and write offers with confidence. Um, it was never a surprise to her you know, a week before closing. So, um, in keeping with Jeff's theme today <clears throat> in team building, you know, I would really recommend that as you build your confidence um, as a realtor and with your clients, that you begin to feel confident in introducing them to your team, which would include a strong mortgage professional escrow team, and just let them know that they're going to be in really good hands if they stick with your team. Um, of course, they always have the option to do whatever they want, but in advising them on your experience with the best team, I would highly recommend that you really do talk with them about your favorite mortgage professional, and of course, I hope that that will be me. So give me a call, text, email, anytime. Those of you um, nationally, you can use the 88 number, that's the concierge service, that will um, usually direct right to me, and uh, just pick my brain. You know, I know a lot about underwriting, I know a lot about guidelines. If you feel like you're not getting a straight answer out of your, uh, the lender for your buyer, or maybe it's the buyer of your listing, just call me and ask. If you don't, if it, you know, it doesn't stink, if it doesn't smell right, you know, just let me know. And um, I'll run through the scenario with you and try to get you a second opinion. So don't be afraid to call, text, email me anytime, whether through the 888 number or at my uh, phone number directly. So that's it for me, and I will pass it back over to Victoria. Great. Thank you, Shelley. Um, I would like to start off by giving everyone a brief background history of our company. Matthew Crumbaugh is our CEO. This is a family-owned company. Matt's father, James Allison Crumbaugh III, is the founder of Allison James Estates and Homes. Matt's wife, Jessica Crumbaugh, is the vice president and also a top producing realtor for Allison James. We have recently had some exciting recognition. Matt Crumbaugh was named one of the top 100 most powerful people in the residential real estate industry. Our brokerage was named in the top 100 in two different categories. We were ranked number 85 for transactions and number 99 for sales volume. One of the many things that brings agents to Allison James Estates and Homes is that we pay our agents 100% of their hard-earned commission. I'm going to now pass it over to our presenter and the Director of National Growth and Development here at Allison James Estates and Homes, Jeff Jabora. You can contact him directly at area code 941-677-2544.
or by emailing jjabora at ajicorporate.com. Jeff? Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending today. My name is Jeff Jabora, and I'm the National Director of Growth and Development here at Allison James Estates and Homes. So I have the privilege of working with agents who are interested in coming aboard. I am normally the first contact for people at our company that are interested in joining. Fortunately, this year I did have the honor of attending the NAR convention in New Orleans, and really the main topic there that was buzzing around from vendors, agents, and everyone else was real estate teams. I personally truly believe that teams are going to be the future of this industry. Um, as you all know, we've seen a lot of changes in the industry over the last decade, even over the last year. And once again, I really believe that teams are going to be the future of this industry, which is why we're doing this presentation today. We try to always add value to the brokerage with uh, training, masterminds, webinars, things like that. So I'll start at the very top and work my way down the very basics. What is a real estate team? A real estate team can quite simply be defined as two or more real, real estate agents who work together in a group effort. There's many different types of teams. Uh, we're going to cover just the very basics and get into some of the more um, typical models out there, um, whether it is a you know, husband and wife team, a spouse team, uh, sisters, two friends, whatever it may be. Two or more people that work together in a group effort is a real estate team. What are the benefits of being on a real estate team or being a team leader? The first one would be accountability. Real estate can be a lonely industry to work in sometimes. You know, you feel independent, you're out there on your own, you don't really necessarily have a lot of accountability, people holding you accountable for your business. Being on a team can keep that fire lit under your feet. If you have weekly meetings and someone, okay, what did you do this week? What is your goals? What, what keeps you moving? How many offers did you write? How many showings do you have? That's huge. Uh, normally, the biggest thing that holds people back from being productive is not having the drive to get out there. Uh, training. As being part of a team, there's a lot of extra training available to you through the team leader and other things. Obviously, the team leader is going to be financially vested in your success as well. Um, training is very important. Whether it be you know, you're a brand new agent and you need the kind of training that comes with that or you need to hone your craft a little bit and have updated training on marketing or if it's template emails or if it's dialogues and scripts, whatever it may be, training is always good. Reputation and exposure. Being a part of a team of productive agents or having a group effort here can really help you build your reputation. It's a good sales point when you come for a listing presentation and you explain, hey, I'm part of a team. I'm not the only one that's working to get this house sold. I have five other people on my team and this is our main effort right now is the sale of your home. You know, We have people that work with specifically buyers and we have a buyer's pipeline built. We have people that work specifically with this aspect of it, marketing, whatever it may be. That really helps and it further adds to your exposure. Another good aspect is the delegation of tasks, duties, and responsibilities. This is more so for the team leader. Um, you can only be in one place at a time, and that's really where it's important to start delegating tasks, duties, and responsibilities to other people on the team. And that's the importance of having a buyer's agent or a team of buyer's agents, listing agents, rental agents, uh, someone that handles your marketing, all of that sort of stuff. You cannot do everything at once. You cannot boil the whole ocean, and that's why it's important to have other people that you trust with you. Being a part of your team can absolutely increase your production. If the average agent out there, or not the average agent, but an agent out there can reasonably service, let's say, three transactions a month by themselves without delegating things. I really think that's about the max number one single person can do is three a month. Um, after that, you have the potential to be a 50 or 100 deal a year agent plus, but if you don't have other people working with you, you're going to top out in about the 30s, my opinion. There's probably people out there that can absolutely do more, but you're going to wear yourself very thin. Uh, with increased production, absolutely comes increased profits, and that's really, nobody does this for their health, right? Of course, we have uh, duty and responsibility to our clients, but at the same time, we are in this industry for our livelihood. This is how we make our living, and everybody likes increased profits. Once again, one agent can only close so many transactions. It comes a point where you hit that, well, you know, I have dimes holding up dollars here. I need to have other people help me out and delegate that responsibility. Once again, that is a very important aspect of being on a team is not being scared to delegate um, things to other people. How do I know if I'm ready to be a team leader? Uh, there are so many different aspects of this, and these are just some of the very basic questions. Experience. 
do you have the industry experience and real estate experience and transactional experience to do that? Have you been on a team before? I am a solid believer that if you are going to be a leader, you, have, you need to have been a follower at some point in your life. Um, obviously, working on different teams or different brokerages, you pick up what you do and don't like about how things are run. Um, Unfortunately, as a follower, you don't always have the say to, to change things, but you can absolutely keep that in your, in your mind for when you form your own team or to implement those things to your team of what you did like and what you didn't like and pick up a little bit of things from everybody and kind of piece that together for how you want to run your business. So definitely experience is very important. Ask yourself, you know, would I reasonably be able to be a team leader and ha do I have the experience to do this? Proficiency, if you are not completely 100% proficient in your craft, you probably should not be uh, managing or leading other people, and that just probably goes without saying. Another very important aspect would be value. What kind of value are you offering to be a team leader? Um, is it just saying, I'm the team leader, I'm in charge, everybody do what I say? That doesn't work. You have to have some kind of value. Do you have an additional office space? Do you have marketing? Do you have leads? That's probably the biggest one. Do you have enough leads and enough business to support other people? And do you have the do you, do you have enough value in your business to bring other people on? Do you have a good enough reputation in the industry, in the area, whatever it may be? Financials, very, very important. Are you financially prepared to do this? A lot of the time as a team leader, and once again, depending on the structure of your team, you're the one with your pocketbook on the line here as far as buying the leads and having the systems and paying for the various marketing and that sort of thing. That's a lot of big time investment up front and if you don't structure it the right, right way and you don't have things built out the way they should be, you could lose a lot of money if you don't do it the right way. So you need to make sure that you're financially prepared, number one, to keep your head above water and number two, to prosper. Nobody wants to do this just to survive. You want to flourish. Organization. Do you have systems, technology, accountability? Are you prepared to have weekly team meetings? Are you prepared to have a system for notification? I do need to know about this, this, and this. I don't need to know about that, that, and that. And that's, once again, where delegation is going to come into place. But you can't delegate without having a system built and just expect people to know how you want things done. Uh, most importantly, do you have an overall plan? All of these things coming together as part of your plan. A goal without a plan is just a wish. You know, you can sit here and wish that you were doing 500 deals a year, but if you don't have a plan to get there, it's, it's just a dream. It's just a wish. What is the best model to run? There's no best model. It's whatever works for you is the best model. Um, I'm not trying to tell you that this is the way you should structure a team. This is how you should do it. And we are going to go over a couple of different structures here. It's going to depend on so many different factors when you're choosing how you should structure a team, and that may change as the market changes, um, whatever the case may be. If you're in a market where you know there's only a thousand transactions going a month, uh, you know your 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 team model may be a little bit different than being in an area where there's ten thousand transactions a month that go through. It really just depends. A lot of the factors to consider are the market, um, your experience as a team and a team leader, the overall growth potential and the overall plan. Um, if you're looking to reasonably capture a percentage of closed transactions in that market, you're going to take that into account with how you run your model. Uh, there is no I in team. This is a very important thing to remember that when you become a team, you're no longer just managing your own business. You are managing a group of people. As a team leader, you're a manager, you're an agent, and you're a problem solver for all. Most of the time, especially when you're first starting out, as a team leader, you're still closing deals. You're not sitting behind the desk with your feet up and you do this and you do that. It doesn't work. That would be contradictive um, to the point of being a team leader. So a lot of time, team leaders are absolutely still out there closing transactions and you need to be pre prepared to do that. Not only are you managing your own affairs, you're also helping with other people on your team. Um, you are likely financially interested in their success and as part of a team leader, you have duty to them to help them if they need it and that's part of the added value of being on a team. Another area here where wires can get crossed is knowing when to draw the line. Sometimes the hardest thing in this industry to learn how to say is no, whether that be with people on your team, with clients, whatever it is. There's no friends in business, unfortunately. Um, someone can be your best friend in the world 
and you get along great as individual agents and you go to Taco Tuesday and cocktail hour as friends and talk about business, but when somebody works with you on your team, it may not be rainbows and butterflies. There's going to be times where you disagree, times where they may not like the way that you're structuring things or the way that things are being handled, whatever it is. You need to be able to take that into account and realize that, hey, you know, as the team leader, I'm, I'm the boss. That's the way things are going to be. And if they don't like it, you have to be able to work something out. You know, it's a kind of a, a gray area here of mixing business and, and friendship here. Once again, there's no friends in business. This is a very typical standard six-person team here. Once again, I'm not saying that this is the best way to run a team or the only way. This is just a way to do it, and this is pretty standard. When I was at uh, the NAR convention in New Orleans, I asked some of the bigger team leaders out there how they did it. I reached out to some of our agents across the country that do run teams, and this is kind of a middle ground here. This would be the standard six-person team. You have the team leader, a manager slash listing agent. You know, that manager is the second in command, right, to the team leader there. And a lot of times they're a listing agent too, or maybe they're just a the manager if your team's a little bit bigger, kind of your right-hand person, your go-to person. Uh, you would have another listing agent, a buyer's agent or two, once again, depending on the size of your team, and an assistant. That assistant may or may not be licensed, and we'll go over what the duties of that are. Once again, for the value aspect, which is, the most, in my opinion, one of the most important parts of being a team leader is the value that you add. If you're going to have X amount of licensed people per team, you should figure about 30 leads per month per licensed member should be enough to sustain and be profitable. The team leader adds value, drives leads, manages accounts, delegates, supervises, and oversees. I would say the two most important aspects of this, or three rather, would be adding value, whether that be through driving leads or through mentorship or through training, whatever it is, value is very important. Uh, delegation, once again, you cannot be everywhere at once. You cannot be scared to get delegate things to people and hold them accountable for it. Delegation without supervision is pointless. If you're going to have someone do something and don't follow up with it, there's no point. Another responsibility of the team leader is to organize the team meetings. It is very, very important to have weekly or bi-weekly or bi-monthly or whatever works for your team meetings, whether that be done via webinar or you want them physically in the office or you meet at Starbucks or whatever it may be. Having those accountability meetings and just going over things is very important. A lot of times things can get lost in translation via email or via text or even over the phone. Another good angle of having a live team meeting is that it keeps people accountable. They know every morning, every Monday morning at 9 a.m. and every Friday afternoon at noon, they're having a meeting. And here's the plan for the week. Here's the follow-up for the week if you have a Monday-Friday meeting, which is probably how I would do it, um, or even a Monday-Thursday. What, what are your goals for the week? We'll follow up on Thursday and see how we did. Very important to do that. Uh, to give team recognition, if people are doing well, recognize them, and recognition is not always good. If someone's falling behind or they're not hitting their goals, you need to recognize that and zero in on it. Uh, normally, problems like that don't get better with time, and if you have someone that is just a rock star for you, you need to keep that fire lit for them. Everybody likes a pat on the back. It doesn't matter if you're a top producer, you've been in this for 35 years, and you're the, the king of, or queen of your area. Everybody likes a little bit of recognition, and it's expected. If somebody's out there being a rock star for you, give them a pat on the back. The team leader is normally not the broker of record. Uh, as a team leader, you know you are normally the, probably the first person that they go to if they have a question about a contract or a form or that sort of thing. But once again, knowing when to say no, you're probably not going to be the broker of record. Um, you may very well be, but if you're not, do not give legal advice. Refer things to the broker. When it comes down to it, you're a team leader, not the broker of record. Do not be scared to utilize the support that your brokerage offers. Refer people to the appropriate person for that sort of thing. Nobody knows everything about real estate. If they did, we wouldn't have attorneys. We wouldn't have all of the other people in support of this industry. So don't be scared to say, I don't know. Let me help you find out. Not only will that give them a stronger sense of the support they're going to receive from you, it will also help you to know that sort of thing for the future and build precedence. Uh, the manager. Oftentimes, the manager is a listing agent as well. Um, it just time-wise, uh, listings and managers go together a little bit better than trying to be a buyer's agent and a manager. 
Um, I would say that this person is second in command to the team leader, their right hand go-to person, the person that you rely on. If you want to take a vacation or if you're doing other things, your manager should be someone that you can refer to to is this done or this is what I want done this week or I'm not going to be able to make the meeting this week. Go ahead and lay all this out and then I'll follow up with you on it and let's see where we're at. Um, the manager is normally someone that's been on the team for a while and that you can trust. Um, the manager will manage the day-to-day -day activities, work directly with assistant on policies, uh, probably works directly with buyer's agents, listing agents, you name it. Go over the policies, standards, procedures that you have for your team. Whatever it is that you do, make sure everybody knows what the policy is, what the notification matrix is for that sort of thing, what your system is. You know, this gets uploaded into the CRM, this gets added to the drip campaign market, this gets added to the cold lead list, whatever it is. And the manager is going to help with implementing those policies and making sure that those policies are carried out. Listing agents, they coordinate directly with the manager and the team leader. Um, list properties, farm, canvas, prospect for listing leads. The general duties and responsibility for uh, team success uh, for the listing agent are going to be all of those things. That's what they should be focusing on. Depending on the size of your team, the market, you may not be working with buyers at all as a listing agent. Uh, once again, that's a variable that can only be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. For the most part, in a market that can sustain having specific listing agent and buying agents on a team, if you're the listing agent, you should focus on being the listing agent. You take the listings. If a buyer, buyer's agent on your team gets a listing, it should run through you. Work out some kind of compensation with them for that, for the referral, whatever it is. Now, at the same time here, listing agent gets a buyer. Refer that to the buyer's agent. It just is the fair way of doing things, in my opinion. Once again, run it how you see fit. These are just some of the things I've pieced together. Responsibilities of the buyer's agent. They coordinate directly with the manager and the team leader. They represent buyers, they farm, they canvas, and they prospect for buyer's leads, and they work directly with buyers. That is what they do all day long. The uh, general duties and responsibilities of team success fall on the buyer's agents, once again, to represent buyers. Uh, depending on the size of the team, the market, etc., it may they may not be working with listings at all, just as I said before with the listing agent. Just kind of flip-flopping responsibilities here. Um, Buyer's agents, you're probably going to have more buyer's agents than you do listing agents because of the time involved with being a buyer's agent. Um, it's not uncommon to have multiple buyer's agents and one listing agent. It just really depends on the structure of the team, the market, all of those sorts of things. Delegate and then supervise. As a team leader, or as anybody rather, your time is valuable. If you're the team leader, I cannot stress to you enough how much delegate, how important delegation of responsibility is. You can't be everywhere at once. Uh, supervising and, and following up is one thing. Micromanaging is another. Nobody wants to be micromanaged. Nobody needs their shoulder to be looked over all the time. But at the same time, once again, you're the one with your money and your time and, and your business on the line here. Um, if you don't follow up with the things that you want done and do spot checks to make sure, you just never know. You know, you have people out there um, taking a shot in the dark or wh whether or not your business is going to prosper here. You got to trust the people on your team or they shouldn't be on your team. Don't be scared to have a vetting process uh, to interview people before they come on your team. Ask them, how long have you been licensed? You know, how many transactions a year have you closed? Why are you wanting to be a member of the team? It is very, very important to know that and understand everybody. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. Everybody has different wants and different needs and different goals. You know, if you're looking to be a high volume team and you want to have everyone on your team closes two deals a month and you have someone that's happy with closing six deals a year, that's not going to work probably, and you need to do that kind of stuff. Set goals. Trust people. Ensure that they have these systems built and they know what you want in order to follow the guidelines of being on the team. You cannot be everywhere at once. Delegating this type of stuff is what the purpose of having a team is, is to help you grow the business. Accountability. I think accountability is huge. Once again, when you have people out there representing the team and, and representing you, they are a direct reflection of you. Um, accountability is very, very important. You do need to hold team members accountable. Obviously, they're on the team for a reason. They see added value in working with you. They're there to make money and to provide a service just like you are. Um, it's very important to have weekly meetings. Once again, my stance on that would be I would probably have a Monday morning meeting and then a Thursday afternoon or a Friday early afternoon meeting as well so that you can Monday set your goals for the week and follow up from any um, unclosed business from the week before. 
and then talk about, okay, what do we have going on? Where are you at with your prospecting? How many calls did you make? How many emails? What's going on? Do we have any listings coming up? Or, hey, you know, we have a listing coming up here. Do we have any buyers that meet that criteria? Let's get the buyer's agent on that that sort of thing and this also comes down to organization and structure as well to make sure that everybody is presenting what needs to be presented at these meetings they're being diligent and they're on top of things um, the setting actual GCI and transaction goals per month quarter year is very very important if you just say go out there and do your best and let's see what happens that may not work maybe maybe starting out so you can get an idea of where people are at but you should have expectations and these expectations and goals should be reasonable, they should be feasible, you should have systems in place to help them do that, and it should be trackable. Um, you know, in order to close two transactions per month, which is the goal, you need to make X amount of impressions, you need to have this many phone calls made, you need to do this much prospecting, you need to do this much door knocking, whatever it may be. Help them build a system hold them accountable to that system and see where their actions are at, see where the, the, the production is at based off that. Now, not everyone is going to go on transaction. They might be more so chasing GCI. You know, you can have two or three $200,000 transactions or you can have a million dollar transaction. Whatever it may be, make sure that you have that laid out clearly so that everyone understands it, not only the goal and the expectation, but how to get there. Um, you need to inspect what you expect. And that's where spot checks come into play. Um, if you have everyone on one CRM that you're using that you can monitor as a team leader and they're supposed to be making 50 phone calls a day, do a spot check here and there and see if people are logging their calls. Are they sending emails? Are they updating the CRM? Are they sending out thank you cards? Are they door knocking? That sort of thing. If you don't know and you don't follow up and then things go south, ultimately you're the one responsible and you're the one probably losing money. If you want things done a certain way, make sure you train them on how to do it that way. If the precedence is that you set everything up and everything goes to the manager first and the manager is the one that does all the entry or the assistant or whatever it is, make sure that you have a system for that and once again is clearly defined and easily understood by all parties involved. That really eliminates a lot of the confusion that comes with that and I think confusion is probably the number one biggest thing that prevents people from being productive. So if you have a clear, defined mission statement and policies in place, that really helps a lot with it. Praise. Uh, don't be scared to give praise to those who deserve it. Once again, if you have someone out there who is just doing well this month and they're the agent of the month or the agent of the quarter, let them know that. Get them a restaurant gift card. You know, Give them an extra three days off, whatever it may be. Have some kind of praise and recognition for that, and that helps people. Everyone wants a pat on the back. Um, have you know quarterly team dinners if everyone on the team met their goal. Maybe you know take them for a night out on the town or or raffle off gift cards, whatever it may be. Having some kind of praise like that really helps people. It builds cohesion amongst the team, and it's just a great way. Um, another angle you might be able to do with that is to increase somebody's split at some point. And that, once again, this may not always work with your model. But let's say that everybody starts on an X amount for their split. Um, you know, once you've done this much GCI for the year, you bump up to this one for the end of the year. Or the first person to hit X amount in GCI in this quarter or this year bumps up to this for the rest of the year. Maybe you only do it for one person, one buyer's agent, one listing agent, whatever it may be. So, you know, a valuable team member is a, is a rare commodity. To have someone you can trust and is productive out there, give them a goal to work towards it. When they meet it or exceed it, Give them praise. I think that is very, very important. A team agreement. This is probably one of the most important aspects. A verbal agreement is fine and dandy, but until you have it on contract and on paper and signed and witnessed and all of those sorts of things, um, it's not necessarily binding. It could really be vague and indefinite and people may not have understood it, whatever it is. Have a solid contract. Don't be scared to spend the money to have this done professionally to ensure that it's number one compliant and number two, everybody understands it. Ensure all the team members understand everything. Don't have any surprises or hidden clauses or hidden fees or if you do this and this, then the, the split is actually this or anything like that that people don't clearly understand. That can cause a lot of problems within the team. If somebody thought they were on a 70-30 and they're not, they're really on a 60-40 and then it comes time to closing, that can really ruffle some feathers and cause problems within the team. Um, the next thing you know, that can spread like a poison. So whatever it is that you're offering, hold yourself to it, hold other agents to it, and just do the right thing and make sure that it's clearly outlined, of course. 
what is a fair split? Um, this is going to depend on a lot of things. What kind of value are you providing? Do they have an office space? Do they have uh, leads that you provide? Are you the one paying for all the systems up front? Are you the one that pays for everything and they're just the ones that do it? There's so many different factors in this. Uh, what kind of risk or overhead do the team members have? A lot of the time, and this is really kind of the common trend I've seen, is the team leader is the one that takes all of the financial overhead. They are paying for leads. They have their Zillow, their Trulia, their Homes.com, Boomtown, whatever it is. They're paying for their you know, private third-party CRMs like Top Producer or Salesforce. Uh, they're the ones that have some kind of uh, cell phone system or Google, whatever it may be. They're paying for all the emails, all the websites, all that sort of thing. If somebody has that kind of overhead and they're doing all that, my personal stance is a 50-50 split would be fair. Uh, the members of the team have no overhead. They have no risk. You as a team leader carry everything. If they don't close transactions, you're the one ultimately losing money in the long haul. Um, of course, that's negotiable. A lot of it depends on what the team members are bringing to the table too. You know, Do they have a list of, of buyers that they're bringing in with them? Do they have a list of sellers? Do they have a network built? Are they a brand new agent? Are they brand new to the area? Or have they been in the area for years and they're established and they're just looking to be on the team for cohesion? There are so many different angles to this and so many different ways, and those are all the factors that need to be taken into account. And also, of course, what your overhead is. You know, if you factor that if everybody can close one or two deals a month or whatever your goal is at the average price point in that market, do the math. Crunch those numbers and see where they need to come back at and what kind of split you can afford to pay. Um, you know, once again, this comes down to what are you offering, and they know what they're getting into before they come aboard the team. If they don't like it or they don't think it's fair, they don't have to be on the team, and that's pretty much the end of the story with that. Make sure that you lay everything out up front, that you have the numbers and the backing, and that you've done your diligence and researched it to make sure that you're going to be profitable and be able to sustain and flourish. Here's a really very controversial topic when people are coming to a team, especially if they have been or were at some point a experienced agent or someone with you know, some clout in the, in the area here, is their own SOI, their own sphere of influence business versus team business. You know, someone may say, okay, you know, you're coming aboard the team, I'm giving you leads, I'm giving you a system, all this stuff, and, and you know, you're going to be on an X amount split with me. The first question that most people are going to ask is, what about my own SOI business? At some point, it is going to be commingled. You know, what is considered SOI versus team business? Let's say that you give somebody a lead, and then they get a referral from that lead, and, you know, they took a listing or they represented a buyer, and that buyer or that seller said, hey, by the way, my cousin wants to sell a house or my cousin wants to buy a house. Can you help this person? Then you get into the area, well, is that an SOI lead or is that a team lead because I'm the one that paid for it in the first place, and that really can cause a lot of problems too. This is what I would do, and this is what I've known a lot of other industry professionals to do, is to have this mapped out ahead of time and agreed upon ahead of time, of course. And you can have a 90 or 180 day or a 12 month or a 3 month, whatever works for you and whatever you agree upon, an SOI list. Okay, I understand that you have some of your own sphere of influence, that you've been working some leads recently. Let's go ahead and have those on an Excel file. And we're going to save those as your SOI list. And we need a name, an email address, and a phone number, or a name and an email, or whatever it may be, um, how you know the person, however specific you want to get with it. And let's say that you are going to work that out. Okay, I understand you had some of your own stuff going before you came here. You know, We're going to give you X amount of a split on your own SOI for the first 90 days or the first 180 days, whatever it is. And after that, all of your business, whether it's you know your next-door neighbor said they want to sell a house, um, or if it's a lead that I gave you, is going to be run at this split. There's just too much room for commingling and, and confusion, and uh, people get upset about that sort of thing. So I think the most reasonable and prudent thing to do is to offer them a 90-day, 180-day list they can bring in. If they close any of that business that, they, that was their own in that time frame, it's at you know a higher split because it was their own SOI versus a team lead that you provided, you paid for, you nurtured, whatever it may be. I think that's a very fair way of doing things. Once again, not the only way, it's just a way of doing it. Uh, how do we structure the splits? There's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, everything I talked about before is kind of assuming that the team leader is the one with all of the overhead out there. That's not always the case. Some of the terminology that I picked up from talking with other agents is what's quite simply known as a bucket team. A lot of the times people that are on these bucket teams are a little bit more closely linked than just a group of agents. 
a lot of times it's going to be spouses or family or people that are you know good friends and have been on a team for years. Um, a lot of times these are smaller teams. And the way that works is, hey, you know, we're all established professionals. We all, everything you have, you throw in the bucket, and it gets split however many people are on the team that many ways. Let's say you have five people on your team. Every time someone closes a deal, it gets thrown in the bucket, and it gets split five ways. Once again, that's more so for your people that are more connected to each other than the average team. A lot of times we see that with family teams. So the bucket team is great for smaller groups, and if everybody's pulling their own weight, um, you know, if one person closed 20 deals last year and threw everything they had in the bucket to be split up a couple different ways, and one person closed five deals, is that fair? You know, and once again, that's where the accountability and that sort of thing uh, comes into play, and you need to renegotiate that kind of stuff and, and work on things if that becomes an issue. Um, the individual efforts team. This is where everybody is on their own, you know, their individual effort, and they just are on whatever with the team leader. You know, I have my own individual things that I'm doing. I'm still on a team, but my income is directly dependent on my hard work and my diligence and my production. You know, I'm on an X amount of split with the team leader as a team agreement split, of course, and all of that goes towards the team leader and myself. It's not split up with other people on a team, whatever it may be. I think that's probably the most common way that that's done and the most popular and probably the most efficient. Um, I'm a firm believer in you reap what you sow. It's not always fair that you're the one out there killing it and being a rock star and you're you know, pulling someone else's slack who's been sleeping in and being lazy and not prospecting. Also, the advancement team, where this is where it comes into play, where you, know, you start out at X amount for the year. After you do a certain amount of GCI, then you bump up to a higher split, whatever it may be. That kind of stuff gets really tricky, and that really is going to depend on what you're bringing to the table yourself as an agent. Um, I probably would say that's the least common and least popular of the group. I really think the individual efforts style is the, the best way. Um, another thing to take into account here is what kind of splits or what kind of um, fees are due to your brokerage. Um, a lot of times, everybody pays their own individual fees to the brokerage, whatever that may be, and then they work out. Uh, the team leader from what's left after that. Sometimes the team leader takes the overhead of that and says, you know what, I am going to pay your plan fee or I am going to pay your E&O for you. And then that team member really has no overhead whatsoever. Um, and that's even easier to justify taking a higher split at that point in time or a higher team agreement. Once again, it's, every team is going to be different. Whatever your style is and however you want to run it, it's your show. You're the captain of the ship. Uh, steer it the direction you want it to be steered. Some of the common concerns that people have with running a team are why would I want to train someone who's going to go leave and start their own team? You know, that's a risk that you face. Um, obviously, they came to your team in the first place for a reason, whether you recruited them or they solicited you to join. That's a risk that you face. People move, people leave, people want to branch out on their own. A lot of the times this happens, people, you know, they puff their chest out, their head gets a little big, they think they, you know, I killed it this year, I did so many deals, this, that, and the other, and they don't take into account that that probably would not have been possible without the support of that team leader, and they want to branch out on their own. Um, it doesn't always work out in that person's favor, and that is a risk that you incur. That is why it is very important to have some kind of contract in place to cover that sort of thing. I can't really dive into what is and isn't legal or compliant per your state. Definitely have a really strong contract written for that sort of stuff. Um, if someone's going to leave, make sure you have an agreement in place for that. If you know what happens with active listings or whatever it may be, just cover your cover your base. Excuse me, cover your bases on that one. Uh, what if a team leader leaves and they take leads or they poach leads from me on the way out? Once again, that's a risk incurred. You know, if you have a CRM and you have all the leads in there and they decide they're going to leave brokerages or just not be on the team anymore, who's to say they didn't copy and paste uh, on the way out and take all those leads? You can only do so much tracking on that kind of stuff. Um, hopefully, people take the higher ground on that and that they realize that was a, a lead that you procured. Um, I would recommend that you keep an eye on them, on their production in the NLS, and cross-reference some names and, and call them out on it directly and see what you can work out. This gets into kind of a legal issue. This is something you would definitely want to, once again, have a solid contract. Uh, what if it doesn't work out between us? Hopefully, both sides of this take the high ground and realize that not everybody is meant to do business together. You can be the best of friends in the world, but when it comes down to the brass tacks of running a business with somebody or, or doing business with someone, it doesn't always work. A lot of times, people that are best friends should not be business partners. Um, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Hopefully, you have the 
professional and, and personal courtesy on both ends here to just end it peacefully and know that you know it's just not working. These are common concerns, and this is the real world. This is life. That's what happens. Not everything is going to be just how it reads in a textbook. And this is where your industry experience and your knowledge and the people skills that you've gathered from being a professional real estate agent are going to come into play in dealing with other sales professionals. There's really no coverall answer for these things. These are just things to take up into consideration up front and be prepared to handle these because it is going to happen. It absolutely is. Um, another aspect of this is recruiting. When you are recruiting for your team, it is very, very important to screen people up front. A lot of that can be, a lot of these things can be mitigated or at least minimized if you screen people heavily up front. Don't be scared to vet people. Don't be scared to ask someone for a resume. Ask them, what are you bringing to the team? I know what I'm offering. What are you offering? How do I know you're reliable? How do I know you're dependable? How do I know that you're going to come to these team meetings? Uh, don't have empty threats. If the policy is that, hey, you know, if you miss two, you know, if you don't come to a team meeting, you better have a good reason. Or if you're not closing GCI, if you're not closing deals, you better have a good reason. Or you get put in a probationary period. Or, hey, you know, you have three bad months in a row. That's it. You're off the team. Do not give special exceptions. You need to draw a hard line and stick to it. And that's just the way it is. Um, once again, the hardest thing to say sometimes in this industry is no. Really, that was just kind of a coverall, some of the basic things of running a team and things to take into consideration if you are looking to start a team. A lot of this is just common sense things that you don't necessarily think of until you really get down to it and you're starting to form your team and, and realize some of the issues that may arise and some of the preparation that comes into play when you're doing it. Um, I've talked to multiple agents across the country, some of our own team leaders out there who said it's a struggle. It's not an overnight process. It's building systems. It's learning from your mistakes and making yourself better from it. Um, it's not always going to be smooth sailing from day one. You need to be able to improvise, adapt, and overcome and roll with the punches and keep your business moving. Regardless of how bad things are flowing, the show's got to go on. you got to get out there. You have to prospect. You have to make your own calls. And as a team leader, do not give up getting out there and doing your own deals. It is still going to be the bread and butter of your business. So if anybody has any questions, we'll go ahead and start taking those now. Uh, Victoria will, will read them off. If we don't have time to get to your questions, please shoot me an email. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have via email and follow up with you. Or you can contact me directly via telephone as well. Victoria? Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we do have a question here. You did touch base on it, though. It's um, with teams, what's the standard for the splits with leaders, manager, and team members? Um, like you had mentioned, it does depend on different factors and the structure of the team. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add into that, Jeff? Yeah, I think that there's, once again, there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, the starting split is not always the final split. I think that whatever you're going to do, once again, have it clearly mapped out. If you're going to, if you're the one taking all of the overhead, I think a 50-50 split is fair. And then maybe after they've closed 12 transactions or 10 transactions or after they've done a certain amount of GCI, maybe bump their split up and that's their new split. Um, kind of a probationary period for vetting people um, and seeing how things work on the team. As far as the split overall, it's too hard for me to give a definitive answer on that because every market is different, every team structure is different, and the amount of value that you do or don't add in the market that you're working in is the two factors that are most heavily involved with making that kind of decision. So really, once again, crunch your numbers and see where you're at and see what kind of production they need to have and what the average sales price is in that market and what your overhead is. And I think that will give you a very clear answer or very, you know, clear guidelines as to some reasonable splits you can offer. And another thing to take into account is that these people have to survive too. Um, it's, you know, as a team leader, it's not always the, the Jeff show. You have to realize that other people have families, they have bills, they have overhead, they have things that they need to do as well. Um, so you definitely don't want to be a tyrant or, or, or you know, take everybody's money. Up. They're the ones doing the work as well. Okay. We do have another question here. I'm currently starting a team. What would you suggest is the best way to find agents, and do you have any specific questions lists or personality tests to help find the best team members? Yes. So the best way to find teams, or excuse me, other members of your team is going to be look within your brokerage first. Obviously, not everybody's brokerage is going to be big enough to start drawing from for a team. Um, I would say if your brokerage allows for it, to reach out within your brokerage first. Social media, you know, as, as a realtor, 
your Facebook probably has mostly other realtors on there. I know mine sure does. Um, if I were going to start planning for a team or recruiting for a team, the first thing I would do is start with my own sphere of influence, other agents within my brokerage. I would then start blasting on social media websites, and then I would start sending out emails too. Um, start sending out emails to people. If you find an agent that you work with that you really like, tell them, hey, I'm looking to start a team, and here's what I think we can do together. Are you interested and work things out. I think that would be the first uh, place to start. And then as far as questions for personality tests and things like that, um, I, th I personally, I like the DISC test, D-I-S-C. You can just Google it. Um, there's a million and one different similar tests like that out there. I think that's pretty good if somebody's DI dependent or IS dependent or whatever it is to flow. And another thing to take into account is that you're not going to want five or six people that are all the same and that is exactly like you. You want a good mix of people. Um, not everybody can work with everybody. You know, as realtors, we've all had to, for lack of better terms, fire a client before. Um, it's just the, the nature of the beast. So you need to have people that are able to, you know, work with other people. People that are a little bit different is a good mix to throw into the team there. So once again, that's DISC um, personality test. If you just Google that, it'll pop up. And then there are vendors out there that sell that kind of stuff. Um, some of these motivational speakers in the industry offer those sorts of services. A lot of that can be found online for free. And a lot of that is also going to be just a general interview with people and just asking blatant and to the point questions. You'd be surprised what people are willing to share with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another one here. Jeff, do you get involved with team leaders in finding members and helping set up the system? Within our brokerage, uh, absolutely. Um, at the same time, it really depends on what they're looking to do and what their market is. I may not always have market knowledge for that particular area, um, for an area I'm comfortable with, or if it's someone that can kind of relay that information to me, I absolutely would. At our brokerage in particular, we are the extremely team friendly. I don't think you can find a more team friendly brokerage out there with the way that we structure things and the compensation paid to team leaders. We actually pay our team leaders a referral for every agent on their team that they recruited or referred to the brokerage. So that really helps with their overhead too. Um, so yes, for an agent, of course, within our brokerage, I would absolutely help them do that. Um, so long as I was able to reasonably understand what their goals were, uh, the value that they were offering, and the market that they were in. So if you're one of our agents that asked that question, please send me an email after this. I'd love to connect with you about it and help you grow your team. Perfect. And we do have another question here. Will you email this presentation out to the attendees? Yes, I will be sending out the recorded version of this webinar to everyone as soon as it is over. And if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, I'm sure we can send that over as well. Absolutely. On um, the PowerPoint presentation, we can clean up a little bit. I don't know that you'd want the one with the question slide and stuff on it. Mm -hmm. I do have one like that prepared that we're going to clean up a little bit. We can absolutely send that out to you. And then we also post all of our uh, monthly webinars on our website, and we're going to we are going to send out the link for that as well. We've had some really great um, presentations in the past that are also good to refer back to as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, we can absolutely accommodate that for you. Oh, great. Uh, and then we have another one here. You say to give agents a timeline on amount of closings per month. When an agent starts on the team, when should that time frame start? Once again, it's going to depend on your market. If you're in a hot market where you know deals are closing left, right, and center, um, I honestly think 90 days is a reasonable timeline to get things built up for them to learn your system. I'm not saying that you shouldn't hold them accountable and have some kind of expectation within that but a good 90-day probationary period to see where they're at and if they at least have the momentum building or built up to get there um, is a good indicator. So I think if you're expecting, let's say, two transactions a month out of people, after about 90 days, if you had the right kind of value to be running a team, they should be rocking and rolling. Um, I'm fairly confident in my abilities. Let me rephrase that. I'm very confident in my abilities. If I were to just go out and be, you know, a, a realtor and be a part of a team and that was the expectation and I had the systems built, I would absolutely be able to start closing two deals a month here in the San Diego area. But that may be different for Portland, Oregon, or San Francisco, or Austin, Texas. It just depends on the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that is it. Um, is there anything else, Jeff, that you would like to say? Yes. Uh, once again, thank you so much for attending. This is just a general presentation. It's not reasonable to um, cover everything or to be able to answer every type of question. A lot of this is going to depend on what you're offering, the market that you're in, 
and the, the value that you are going to provide and what your goals are. Um, not everybody is looking to start a 500 deal a year team. Some people would be happy having a 50 deal a year team. It's just knowing what your goals are, having a plan in place, doing your research, doing your diligence, crunching your numbers, and having that value. And remember that there is no I in team. When you're on a team, everybody's needs come before yours, and ultimately everybody on that team is a direct reflection of you. Be selective in who works directly with you, and don't be scared to say no. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you.